So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Medicaid, Medication Assisted Treatment in the HCH Community, Strategies for Expanding Services. My name is Barbara DiPietro and I'm the Senior Policy Director with the Council and I'll be acting as a moderator for today's webinar. But thanks to everybody for coming to the discussion. I think given the crisis in the opioid addiction in many places in this country right now, I think medication assisted treatment is one of the most interesting and dynamic discussions that's happening in healthcare right now. I think there's a lot to talk about. We've only got an hour today, so I know we can't cover everything, but I'm really excited to have a fantastic panel of speakers uh, to talk with us today about how the HCH community is doing this work, how we can be getting better, and how we can be sharing advice and lessons learned with each other so that we can get in this right uh, for the people that we're serving. Uh, so as you'll see um, on this uh, next slide here, that this is an event that is uh, supported through a cooperative agreement with the Health Resources and Services Administration at HHS. Yes, this session is being recorded. Yes, the recording will be available on our website along with the slides. And even better, if you registered for this uh, webinar, then we will send you a link to all the materials directly. So all of this will be available. Um, and again, this is a one-hour webinar. We've planned some time at the end for questions and answers. Most of our discussion today will be a panel discussion with our speakers. So it may be that your question or your issue gets addressed somewhere along the way. But you'll note that below the presentation uh, slide, there's a chat box for you to enter any questions or technical issues that you might be having. So type your questions there into that chat box, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, within this presentation. And so now, uh, let me introduce our presenters. Um, so from Project HOPE in Camden, we have Dr. Linda Baselli, who is the Chief Medical Officer, and Brian Colangelo, who is the Director of Mental Health. And from our program at Nassan Healthcare uh, in Sanford, Maine, we've got Marty Sable, who's the Director of Health Services, Dr. Rihanna Meadows, who is the Medical Director, and Dawn Gray, who is the Program Manager of Special Populations. And I really appreciate uh, all of their expertise and time that they're sharing with us today. Uh, so right now, actually, now that you have learned a little bit about us, we want to learn a little bit about you. And so we've got a growing number of people that are coming into the room. And so I know folks are um, working on their email and, and doing other stuff, but here's poll questions and it's voting time. So um, everybody, uh, take a look. What is your primary role uh, in your organization? We've got a lot of different folks signed up for this. And so we just want to get a sense of who's in the room with us and uh, what role, primary role, that you are playing in your organization. Um, and so just taking a look here, it looks like we've got a number of clinical providers, about a third. Um, oh, and we're changing by the minute. Uh, curious, too, just to see like who might be an eligible prescriber with or without a MAT waiver, uh, and what kind of leadership or other administration we have. Maybe some other folks, if you're in the government, uh, or other types of roles here. Uh, you're obviously also very important to this issue. Okay, so um, this gives us uh, some pretty good um, understanding. So, yeah, about a third of folks, other clinical providers, uh, about a quarter of folks in, in the other category, and we've got a number of range here. Okay, Hannah, can we get the next poll question? Coming up, okay. So are you currently prescribing MAT at your program? So it may be that you personally are not, but that your program is. And we're trying to get an understanding of um, do we have experienced uh, pr um, established programs uh, that have called in, or folks who are newer to, to doing that, uh, or maybe folks that are on the cusp of starting a program, or people who don't envision this happening anytime soon, but are still here to learn more information. We really just want to make sure that we're, we're hitting this for everybody. And so, so far it looks like um, again, we have a lot of folks in the other categories, so that makes sense that about a third are not applicable. But we've got about a third who are an established program, and then about 15% in a new program. Okay, very good. Third question. Um, so what, for those who answered yes um, in the prior question, that you are currently prescribing that at your program, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of program it is? And so, and we'll be talking a little bit about this too in, in this discussion. Is it a more traditional program, 
uh, or is it a um, lower barrier program? Is it something in between, maybe a hybrid? Or it may be that you don't know how to characterize it, and that's fine, too. Um, no wrong answers here. Uh, just, again, trying to get a sense of uh, the, the format and, and, and the framework of the programs that you're working in here. So it looks like two-thirds of folks, okay, I've got something in between. So, so maybe a mix of these characteristics. Okay. That works just great. Uh, and then uh, thank you, Hannah. appreciate the, the poll questions. And we will continue on just to give you a sense of what we'll be talking about today. Um, in a minute here, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Baselli and Brian to talk a little bit about their, pro their HCH program and their MAT program um, at Project HOPE. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Marty and Dawn and Dr. Meadows to talk a little bit about their program at NASA on Healthcare. I'll spend a few minutes just doing a quick overview of the policy brief findings uh, that supported this webinar here. And then we'll move uh, to our panel discussion. And then this is just a few things that we were hoping you would take away from our discussion today. So why HCH programs are, are doing more MAT uh, than compared to other types of health centers, a few challenges that uh, HCH programs have encountered in this way, and then at least three strategies. So uh, apparently brought to you by the letter three today. And so uh, just be thinking about that as you move along. Uh, we really want this to be a good learning opportunity for everybody. This is obviously a critical issue and a really life-saving service. So uh, with that, why don't I turn it over uh, to my colleagues at Project HOPE, where they can uh, talk a little bit about their program. Awesome. Thanks so much, Barbara. Um, so first things first, yeah, let me, Barbara, say thank you to you um, for putting this together. Um, and I've, I've known you for a long time, and so thank you for all of the work that you do um, with the, the Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Um, and thanks to everybody that's, that's participating and listening in, and, and thanks to our colleagues over at NASA on Healthcare. Um, so yeah, so my name is Brian Colangelo. I am the Director of Mental Health and Behavioral Health Services here at Project Hope in Camden, New Jersey. I'm here with Dr. Linda Baselli. She is our Chief Medical Officer. Um, and so uh, first, thing, first thing I want to do is tell you a little bit about just the kind of the, the real quick and dirty version of who we are. So we are located in Camden, New Jersey. We're across the river from Philadelphia. Um, we're a relatively um, impoverished area, a relatively small city, um, pretty urban area, fairly high rates of, um, of, of opioid use. Um, and a number of different issues. So you kind of see there up on the first slide. Um, go on to my next slide. There we go. Um, we are we're relatively small at QHC. We've we've been around for a little over 20 years. Started as a street street outreach medicine team, moved to a mobile health van, and we've grown over the years. Um, so right now we see about 5,000 unduplicated patients for a little over 20,000 visits. We are also a licensed community mental health agency with the state of New Jersey. We have staff of about, so about 52 people now, um, collaborating 340B formulary, pharmacy, um, a mobile health band that does some different services in the community, works at some of the local shelters. Um, and uh, probably is similar to most of the other QHCs and people are on, you know, we provide primary medical care services, laboratory services. We have a uh, fully integrated behavioral health care program. Um, we see insured as well as uninsured folks, no residency requirements. Um, and I, I included a picture of our, our fantastic staff because they, they do an incredible amount of work and uh, just feel like I always need to, uh, to recognize them. Um, so we've got a staff of six primary care medical providers, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, we've got five clinical social workers, two substance abuse counselors, three RNs, five medical assistants, case managers, peer advocate, and then a lot of support staff, receptionists, billing, all those great people. Um, and, you know, as I should say, if you have questions, feel free to, to put them in there. We'll address them at the end. I know I go through this stuff fast because um, we've got a lot of stuff we've got to cover in an hour. And we're really excited about talking about this stuff. Um, so we got to try to cram in lots of stuff. But just kind of talking about the evolution of our opioid dependence treatment. We wrote our first uh, Suboxone prescription June 4th, 2013. 
Um, I'll let Dr. Baselli kind of talk about that experience. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's funny that you remember the exact date. Yeah. Um, I remember the exact patient. It was someone who had been asking for um, medication-assisted treatment with buprenorphine for a number of months, and I always promised her she'd be my first patient, and she was. We got started prescribing buprenorphine um, a couple of years after I arrived at Project Hope as a family physician. And my first or second day of work at Project Hope, Brian asked me if I would be willing to prescribe buprenorphine for the patients. And not knowing a whole lot about it at the time, I said, sure. And it took us a couple of years to get there. Um, and so there, I, I'm not going to go into all of that, but we've, we've got kind of a brief timeline of the milestones for our opioid dependence treatment over the years, the kind of the, the different projects we've worked on, HRSA expansion grants, SAMHSA grants, um, work with community partners. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about what, what brought us to that place. Um, these are the big points of, of why we started doing this. Really, at the time, there was not a lot of access to buprenorphine in the, in the, in the whole community. Um, you know, pretty much the options were private physicians, mostly in the suburbs, who were charging about several hundred dollars for an initial visit and $100, $150 for a follow-up, which was just um, unaccessible for most of our patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody was prescribing to a Medicaid-insured population. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so patients really, their, their only, their, their options were, were limited. They were limited to methadone, um, which at that time had often had a wait list. Um, accessing treatment was tough. And treatment wasn't always the highest quality. Um, regulatory structures and payment reimbursements for methadone really prohibits, um, I think, higher quality care. Um, and I, I know I'm, I'm close on my time, so I'm, I'm going to, again, try to just get through some of this as quick as I can. But just give you an overall kind of view of what our addiction pharmacotherapy looks like. Um, right now, we currently have a panel of about 300 patients. All six of our prescribers, prescribers are wavered. Um, we offer pretty robust um, services as far as our behavioral health, individual and group counseling by substance abuse counselors as well as licensed clinical social workers. We see patients anywhere from a week to once a month. Um, we do a lot of work on uh, diversion prevention. Um, again, we're happy to, you know, talk about all of the challenges and struggles that we've gone through with insurance authorizations, urine drug screens, workflows, managing wait lists, um, you know, and, 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 and working with community partners as well. You know, we partnered with our, our local community jail. So, um, and then just finally, and again, we'll revisit some of this stuff when we do some of the discussion issues, but talking about how we spread the word for this work, how we partnered with some of our other community agencies, how we got some other community agencies to um, start doing this work as well, how we try to identify and improve low barrier care. We use a medication first approach. We did put in um, our document there and the resources that you can find that is our medication first approach, which we, we borrowed from you know, folks in Missouri, so we can't take full credit for that. Um, we work a lot on trying to reduce stigma. Um, and again, that's it in a nutshell. So um, I, will, I will turn it over next to our colleagues. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marty Sable here. Good, good to be with you. Just like to tell you a little bit about our agency, our, our health center. And um, Dawn and Rihanna will take it from there with our uh, MAT program. So. Um, yeah, Nassau Healthcare is actually a division of a larger organization called York County Community Action. We're one of the original community action programs that date back to the mid-60s and the uh, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. Um, our agency mission is basically to address the root causes and manifestations of poverty and to promote um, dignity and self-sufficiency for the people who live in our county. Um, York County is at the southern tip of Maine, where we are about 220,000 people living in an area roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. We've got the Gold Coast with Kennebunk Port, very high-end resorts. We've got some smaller communities with um, former textile and paper mills, and then we've got a whole lot of rural, um, very low-income, remote communities. Um, NASA on Healthcare is um, a federally qualified health center. We opened in 2005 as a healthcare for the homeless. Uh, 
and Public Housing Primary Care Health Center. And with the Affordable Care Act funds in 2012, we broadened, 2012, we broadened out to become a full um, general community health center. We have um, actually have four sites in York County. We're about to open a fifth. Uh, roughly 5,500, 6,000 active patients, 12 full-time equivalent providers, closer to 15 people, uh, providing integrated behavioral health, medical, and dental services. Um, we are, we, we have um, basically tried to um, develop this MAT program um, on a shoestring. <laughs> we, we um, have received uh, all of the federal funds that are available in terms of medic substance abuse and mental health uh, service expansion dollars. Um, our local University of New England has a grant to uh, a workforce grant that allows for training, providing special training for social work students. And we have one of the rural area uh, uh, consortium grants where we're collaborating with partners throughout your county to uh, basically do an environmental scan, needs assessment, gap analysis, and then eventually pitch, we're in the process of pitching an implementation plan to, to, to broaden out our, our scope of services um, in, in your county. Oh. All right. oh, I've been advancing the slide. Yeah. So this is Dawn. Um, we started our MAT program back in October um, of 2017. And it started as a highly structured um, office-based treatment program where we were um, screening patients to see if they, were, uh, if they were able to do the requirements of the program. And if they were not, we were um, referring them to a higher level of um, treatment. Um, and with this program, and over the last, I'd say, year and a half, we realized that um, it presented a lot of challenges for our patients and our treatment team. And so we decided to move into taking down some of the barriers and move into a low barrier um, treatment structure where we would focus on harm reduction. Um, basically giving Suboxone scripts the same day, um, providing Narcan, um, and working towards creating um, a flexible individualized treatment plan, realizing that patients, patients have um, different reasons for their addiction and we have to really get to the root cause of that in order to come up with a solution. And they may not just fit into one certain type of treatment plan. So we're moving towards, you know, individualizing them um, and making it more patient-centered, meeting them where they're at, breaking down um, more of their barriers, and um, providing more outreach and engagement. Brianna? I think the only thing I'll add to that is that right around the same time, um, within the last year or so, we really started screening for social determinants of health. And that involves looking at things like transportation barriers, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and trying to recognize the roles that those play in our patients' access to care and especially access to MAT services. As a community action agency, we, we think we're pretty well um, situated to address a lot of the social determinants that are barriers to MAT services. Our agency includes a transportation program, housing services, fuel services, um, early childhood, um, Head Start, and WIC. So Barbara, we'll pass it back to you. OK, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, just want to do a quick overview of the policy brief that we just published. You'll see in the resources uh, component here at the bottom, Matt Policy Brief. And that is the link to uh, the paper we just published in partnership with the Kaiser Family Foundation. A lot of this was rooted in the UDS data that health centers are reporting to HRSA each year. Uh, it did a look at that, to f and we found uh, what was interesting is that HCH programs only serve about 4% of all health center patients nationally. But when you look at the number of patients uh, getting buprenorphine, uh, we're providing nearly 40% of that work, again, across all health centers. 
And so thinking about that and, and looking at that, I conducted a series of interviews with over a dozen HCH uh, uh, providers and staff and in different kinds of programs uh, to get a sense of the themes uh, behind the challenges and the strategies that they were working with. And in some cases, it was a, you know, why are you not doing uh, medication-assisted treatment? And just to better understand where people are. So this paper attempts to merge uh, both the UDS uh, and then the qualitative research that we did. And one of the things that's probably not a surprise to many people on this uh, call here is reasons for that are probably because our patients have a higher need of behavioral health care services broadly and opioid use disorder services specifically. So that's one piece. We obviously have a long-standing program requirement to uh, provide substance use disorder services. So I think that positions HCH programs more strongly to do the kind of integrated care work uh, that this requires. And then just our mission and our program model, we tend to be oriented more toward harm reduction. We've got greater experience with treating patients who have got a lot of trauma and who have very high and complex needs. And so, again, I think we're very well positioned to do this work. And I'm excited about sharing what works for us with the broader community so that everyone can be learning uh, here. Uh, just really quick, it's uh, important just to say that everyone is doing more in this space. And I think we're rapidly growing across the country in uh, how much and who is doing medication-assisted treatment. Just even looking at the year-over-year -year, uh, increases from 2016 to 2017, we had an 82% increase in just one year in the number of providers at HCH programs who were waivered, and then we had a 65% increase in the number of patients we were serving. And I anticipate that when the 2018 data becomes available later this year, uh, we'll see some of those similar increases, so I'm excited about that. But I think just to keep this conversation honest, I, I think it's important that not all states are impacted by opioid use disorder in the same way. And so this map here is uh, using data from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which maps what the highest rates of opioid overdose death rates are in the country. And you can see here uh, that states that you've probably seen featured uh, quite prominently uh, in the news and in, and in health reporting uh, are here. So of the 23 states that have been hardest hit, that are in the red here, uh, there, that there are 132 HCH programs in those states. And of those 132 programs, about half have rep reported MAT patients in 2017 data. Again, that's the most recent data we have to analyze. So that's a glass half full, um, and that's doing a lot, but I think that there's real room for growth here. And so, again, the premise of this work was, wow, look at all the work that HCHs are doing. But I think that, too, there is work where we can see, particularly based on where uh, opioid use overdose rates uh, are, are hardest hit, how do we better align our services with what the need is? And again, this is going to look very different for people who are in Texas or in areas where methamphetamine or cocaine or other issues are driving more of their, their problematic substance use disorders, and it may not be opioids. Uh, at the same time, again, I think it's important for everyone to take a hard look at, at what their community needs. Um, it's also important to know that not all HCH programs are autonomous. And many are part of larger health centers or other health systems where they may not be uh, in total control of the types of services they offer. But I do think that this is really important, again, to, to take a look at this. Uh, in the paper, we've got a lot of state-by-state -state data. So if you want to find your state and see how your HCH programs are participating in that, uh, you'll see that in Table 1. And then in Table 2, if you're from one of these uh, red states with the highest uh, death rates, uh, you'll see a little bit more detailed information. And so again, I, I think this is really important for us to take a look at from a needs assessment perspective. Um, so just diving a little bit into uh, the strategies, again, I just want to hit it really briefly so that we can get to our, our discussion. Um, one of the biggest things that people talked about uh, as a challenge and a barrier to starting their program was that they didn't have internal support. Uh, and this could be that they had a CEO or a board member or some key staff uh, that were opposed to offering Suboxone uh, or buprenorphine-based treatment. Uh, it could have been because they had more traditional views of what substance use disorder treatment looked like. They had more uh, just traditional views of what recovery looked like. Uh, or they just weren't prioritizing this issue. 
Um, I did have some folks that said that you know they operate within a within a larger structure, and that the larger organization just didn't want to be known as one of uh, those programs in the community. And so I appreciate that that's a real tension that some folks have within their organization. But a strategy for that, numerous folks talked to me about how important it is to have a champion for Matt in your program, a champion that can work with your CEO or work with people who may have real reservations about this service and really work through that. Uh, I think that was a real consistency. Uh, and then uh, I'm just hitting a couple of pieces here. Diversion was also a concern that a lot of people talked about. Uh, they were very, as a provider, you obviously are concerned when your patients may not be taking all or any of the medication that you prescribe them. And for some folks, that was enough of a concern to prevent them from being willing to do that because they couldn't uh, really guarantee what, what would happen with, with the medication. And I can, all I can say to that is that uh, how do we balance that discussion uh, where treatment can be very hard to find or access? and that patients talk about how they're ambivalent about starting treatment. And so sometimes, yeah, they do buy Suboxone on the street so that they can try it out for themselves. And when they find that it works, uh, they then increasingly want their own prescription and are willing to engage in a, in a formal treatment program. Um, but a lot of folks talk about getting well enough to seek treatment. Uh, a number of clients talked about how uh, they, they didn't buy heroin on the street because they could buy Suboxone. And they really felt like they avoided overdose um, possibilities because of that. So I just think that it's important to balance a lot of aspects of this around a harm reduction aspect. And so I'd like to put a pin in this almost and then come back because I think diversion is a really important issue. Um, second strategy is that a lot of folks said that they're working particularly for more traditionally trained primary care um, providers who just do not have a background in substance use disorder treatment. And so how do we um, build skills, uh, make people more comfortable? Uh, a number of the providers I talked to said that they were nervous about prescri uh, prescribing their way out of a program, uh, problem when they felt like it was prescribing that got us into this problem. And so, again, there may be a number of things going on there, but making people comfortable with what medication-assisted treatment is and how they can be comfortable with this is, is, is a standard of care. Uh, and then a lot of people were talking about starting small with just a few patients and building from there, uh, pairing new providers with more experienced ones so that they can learn how this works, and then uh, here engaging a broader range of staff throughout uh, the organization. So people talked about how do you leverage your outreach workers, your community health workers, your peer specialists to really get the engagement piece for your patients, and that way you can focus more on the clinical care. And so we'll come back to some of these pieces. A few other strategies here. Um, program flexibility. This is clearly one of the biggest issues, is thinking about how are you tailoring your program uh, in an either traditional higher barrier approach, more structure, or are you doing a lower barrier approach where you may not have as many requirements, particularly for counseling. And so this is a, this is a big issue that people have very strong feelings about. And so um, I really feel like this is important to, to come back to, and no doubt we will. I want to draw your attention down to the resources box again, where there's a file called buprenorphine research. Um, this is a short article, um, and um, hats off to Marty for sharing this with me earlier this year, uh, that synthesizes a lot of the current research around a more traditional structured program and a newer lower barrier approach. And it contrasts the, the research behind uh, those, those two approaches. I think we will find it really instructive, particularly if you're trying to be one of those champions in your organization and presenting the research behind what works well and what the newest research is showing. Um, also want to talk about community partnerships and resources. Um, our, our friends in New Jersey and, and Maine had talked both about how they were using their partners, but thinking about your hospitals and, and your, your local uh, criminal justice folks all can be partners with you here. And I think it's important, too, to talk about how both SAMHSA and HRSA at the federal level have been offering numerous grant opportunities, other funding uh, sources, and training opportunities for this. And then there's a host of other organizations that have been doing this work. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to gain the kind of training that we're looking for. Um, and again, uh, I, I do think that, that uh, 
it's there if we want it. And so with that, I, I went through a lot of <laughs> a lot of information really quick. Uh, it's all there in the policy brief, so I didn't want to belabor that. But now let's let's just downshift into into more of a discussion. And so we've got a lot of folks here uh, on our panel who have been really carefully considering how their program uh, is most effective for their patients. And so I want to start uh, with uh, the first question. Uh, when you first got started, what were the biggest challenges that you had to overcome uh, when you first started your program? And just for conference call um, synthesis, how about we start with New Jersey? Um, absolutely, great. Um, so, biggest challenge is to overcome. So, I think some of like some of the stuff you mentioned. I think you know, um, early on, we had prescribers who had a much more traditional view of uh, MAT and struggled with getting on board and doing that. And it was one of those things. It was you know, like these are the patients we're already seeing. Um, they're already they're already our folks. We're already trying to take care of their diabetes and their hypertension, and it's it's hard because we're actively using. Um, so I, I think working through some of those resistance that resistance, um, I think that just um, I think we I think we had pretty good buy-in from our administrative um, team. I think it definitely helped you know being able to demonstrate that like hey these are also visits that we're going to get reimbursed for. Um, both on the medical side and the behavioral health side, so that you know, that makes the financial people happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I think selling it to folks definitely played a big part. Mm -hmm. And I think finding um, finding ways to deal with some of the administrative barriers. Um, one of the biggest challenges in the beginning was sort of um, the volume of uh, prior authorization work we had to do and who was going to be on the phone with the insurance companies, with Medicaid, HMOs to, you know, to get authorization for our patients to get their medication. Um, it was surprising to us initially how long that process took um, and definitely was a barrier. So um, this is Marty. Um, I think our initial concerns were um, that we would become inundated with demand for this service once once word got out that we were um, we were provide we were prescribing suboxone. Um, we we were a little concerned about having the capacity to respond to that demand, and also Maine was um, only just this year um, passed med implemented Medicaid expansion, and um, at the time back in 2017, about a third of our patients were uninsured, and with the cost of suboxone. We had big concerns about how folks were going to be able to cover the cost of their vaccine or, out, excuse me, the treatment, or how um, we were going to cover the cost of the treatment. Um, we, we um, um, yeah, we just perseverated over, <laughs> over these matters for uh, a while and before we actually went live. From a provider standpoint, I think we really struggled with um, initially ensuring the comfort level, much like New Jersey, with all of our providers and making sure that everyone was on board, and not just medical providers, but behavioral health providers and medical assistants and dental providers. Um, <clears throat> how do we maintain support for them and also continue their education as, as the information changes and we learn more about things like concomitant benzo use and what does that mean for our patients. So making sure that everyone's on board and kind of following along with the same pathway. And then how do we provide legal training and issues that come up and risk for diversion and misuse. So I think there was a lot of buy-in that had to happen initially with the medical providers who still wanted to do the right thing. They just weren't quite sure how to make it happen. And I'm curious now that both of your programs have had a few years under under your belt. What are your biggest challenges that you're working through now? Well, I could speak to um, to us at NASA. I think that the biggest challenge we're working on right now is the implementation of a patient -centered, centered model of care. How do we balance out the needs of our patients with the needs of our medical and behavioral health providers? Um, how do we do that? with a workflow that makes sense for everybody so we don't get bogged down in the process. 
And then on top of that, how do we collaborate appropriately between all three disciplines? So medical, our medical providers don't work in a bubble, and neither do our behavioral health or our dental providers. So how can we all communicate effectively to ensure that everyone's on the same page with regard to patient care? Um. Yeah, I, you know, one of the challenges I think that we we struggle with um, is still adapting to every new situation that, that walks in the door. Um, you know, and, and even to address a couple of the questions that came up um, at the same time, um, you know, we constantly get faced with new challenges or issues. And probably one of the biggest things that's always toughest for the for the staff are, you know, what's what's the rule? What's the policy? What's the guideline? Um, we have very Hard, very few hard and fast rules. Um, you know, there's there's no three strikes and you're out type of thing. Um, there's there's nothing that you know. We, we there's very few things that we would look at and say like that's it. Most of the things that we you know we challenge, we say let's discuss as a team. Let's try to identify what the issue is. Let's look at it from a patient-centered approach. Um, you know. What can we do to best support the patient? Which is tough because a lot of times, like we run into these scenarios, and and the staff are like, "Help us because we want an answer." And sometimes there is no answer, and we need to solve and come up with the answer right then and there in the moment. Um, you know, and and one of those things is, yeah, how long should someone be on MAT for? You know, and if you know, I, probably again a whole another discussion that could take a whole another hour, a whole another webinar. Um, you know. I, I don't make determinations, uh, or no, no prescriber makes determinations of how long someone should be on a medication when we're sitting in the office. No one says, you're going to be on insulin for six months. Um, let's figure that out when the time comes. When it's time to go off the medication, let's do it. But right now, our goal is how do we help someone reduce or abstain from using heroin or illicit opioids? How do we help them with their recovery, getting their life together, getting their life stable, housing, employment? benefits, legal issues, let's focus on that. Let's not worry about the medication right now. Any other current challenges that anyone wants to mention before we move on to innovations? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so what have you found that works well? And I know a number of you in my conversations have talked about how you've adapted your program uh, and how you've found some real innovative uh, ways of doing things. And so, uh, curious, maybe we can start with Marty or Dr. Meadows or Dawn about how you've done that in your program. Well, I, would, I think what we have learned is that it's a complicated program to try to manage. As, as Rihanna said, it, it's, it's um, the collaboration between the, 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 the disciplines, between the medical and behavioral health providers is critical. But there's also a piece that's just about managing the spreadsheet, you know, just for the, for the structured program, you know, we just really want to, it's hard to make sure everybody's getting what they need, not dropping off and missing key, um, you know, connections with their, with their behavioral health provider. Um, the, the groups have been a challenge. We're, we're in a rural place, and it's, it, transportation is rough, and it's hard to um, make you know, three visits to the health center in the course of a week when you live 30 miles out and you have a, a rusty old Chevy that doesn't always start. Um, so that's not, a, that's not an approach that works real well, but uh, we, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to address. And we may have land, I mean, we're, we're actually, um, next week, we're, we're actually bringing on a brand new staff, um, a brand new position uh, of director of, of care management services, and one third of that person's job is basically going to be to coordinate um, programs where there's a whole lot of overlap between our our disciplines, between medical, behavioral health, and dental. So um, we're optimistic that that person, in addition to pulling together care management, case management, and community health worker work, um, will really um, be in a better position to coordinate this program generally. Anything to add, uh, Dawn or Dr. Meadows? Okay, and then uh, we can shift Brian or, or Dr. Baselli. What, uh, what innovations have you found particularly work well for your program in Camden? About a year after we started prescribing um, buprenorphine, 
um, we started participating in a Project ECHO uh, that was uh, focused on opioid use disorder and buprenorphine. Um, and that was really crucial for us in terms of um, getting to a comfort level with, um, with harm reduction and a low barrier approach. I mean, we learned very specific, concrete things that helped us. So many clinical questions arise um, that, that you, don't, you don't know the answer to until you're actually sort of faced with it. Um, so for example, UDS results, it's not always the easiest thing to interpret. Um, how to make dosing adjustments, what's too high a dose, what's too low a dose, um, interactions with other medications or illicit drugs, what do I do with this patient who continues to use benzodiazepines? One guideline tells me one thing and another guideline tells me something else. And um, no matter how harm reductionist we thought we were being um, <laughs> with our patients, we present to the ECHO panel of experts, and they could always take it a step further for us. So um, just having, um, having that resource that we could count on, um, you know, every couple of weeks we take the time to, um, to sit down and present patients um, to them, that, that was very time and money very well spent. And we had to have administration buy-in for that because it's, it's provider time and it's productivity lost during those couple of hours every couple of weeks, every couple of weeks. But it's, it's, um, it was crucial for us. Any other innovations that we want to mention? So then let's move forward and talk about Given that you're working in such an intense way and you're trying to marry a lot of these pieces and services of the broader HCH program together around this, what policy changes do you think would be needed, um, either at the federal or state level, uh, to better ensure access to medication-assisted treatment? Um, this is Marty. I, um, a big source of frustration for us is the fact that we're not able to establish uh, a health center site in a correctional setting. We, we our county jail um, is uh, a, a whole lot of our patients move in and out of the county jail, and assuring a continuity of care during these transitions is, is, is we think, very important. And um, if if I, I, I it would be very helpful if we could if we could actually play more of a role in their care while they're incarcerated, and still um, be able to, you know, have main. Well, it's it's, it's all very it's all very complicated. You know, if, if Medicaid served benefits could continue while folks are incarcerated, um, and we were able to provide services in jail, that would be the the perfect world. Other policy changes that folks would like to see? Uh, I, this is Linda from Camden. I'd like to see the requirement for a waiver go away. <laughs> you know, sort of a big picture on the the waiver is a barrier. Having you know having to obtain that waiver is a barrier um, for more patients to be able to access treatment. Um, and additionally, you know, we have been doing a lot of work um, trying to get the prior authorization requirement waived for our Medicaid um, patients. If you have private insurance in New Jersey, you do not need uh, a prior authorization for buprenorphine. However, if you have Medicaid, you need one. And that 72 hours uh, during which a patient may need to wait for that treatment is a nice big window for overdose. Yeah, I, I saw there were a few, um, a few non-health center folks on the the webinar, if there's anyone that's uh, from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, um, we would make a desperate plea that, you know, a huge impediment to care, and I know New Jersey's not alone in this, the number of states that face this barrier, but prior authorizations for, just for buprenorphine, injectable naltrexone, dosage adjustments, um, switching tabs to film, they're, they're, they're unnecessary and they, they really do prevent care, um, and they, they need to go away. Very specific. Uh, 
Any other policy changes before we move on to advice? Okay, um, and if just a kind of thinking back to our poll questions in the beginning, it sounded like we had a pretty wide range of roles that, that are uh, in the room right now and um, hybrid types of programs for those who were doing that. Uh, what advice would you offer to them based on your lessons learned and experience running your programs, particularly um, since both of you have been moving uh, from more structured into a lower barrier uh, model. This is Rihanna Meadows. I would say from, from a medical perspective, and certainly as the supervising physician for the medical providers, I think it's really important to be patient with them. They're having to relearn or learn in a different way um, evidence and information that contradicts many of the things that they were taught in medical school or um, as nurse practitioners or as PAs. And so I think we've had to be very patient as they kind of work through this process and recognize that um, our, in, the implementation of our program has taken time and with very clear clinical guidelines, I think it helps to set a framework for them to move forward with their process of, of buy-in to a harm reduction and a patient-centered model of care. Marty, I, I think it's important to view this from, from two um, perspectives. One is um, people at risk for overdosing from heroin use are probably not in, con there's probably not a consensus among them that they're, it's time for treatment for opioid use disorder. But I think as providers, it's, it's critical to recognize that people are, are dying, that um, even if the person, the patient is not ready for a full in embracing embrace of uh, medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, it's really incumbent on us to to do all that we can to prevent overdoses, and that's you know super low barrier access to buprenorphine, Narcan, needle exchange, supervised injection space, um, sort of controversial, uh, hard sell politically, but that's um, I think that's critical. And then, you know, as folks are engaged with these harm reduction efforts, they may be, um, they would have access to information about getting treatment. And I think with those two approaches, just, yes, certainly having high-end, highly structured treatment programs, but first and foremost, prevent overdoses. Any last thoughts that you would like to Oh, sorry, don't interrupt anyone. Okay, um, just any last thoughts on advice before we uh, answer some of the questions that have come in? Yeah, you know, one, one last thing to kind of, that I was going to touch on, um, just kind of as far as an implementation advice point, um, I, don't, I don't think I can stress it enough, is, is really having a team-based based approach um, and really utilizing you know, whatever people that you have and whatever disciplines you have at your health center. Um, I mean, again, I, I think we're fortunate in that we've, we've got a pretty robust behavioral health department with clinical social workers with substance abuse counselors. Um, but but no, one, no one is seeing a patient alone. Um, you know, for, for folks that are really challenging, it really is about how does everyone come together to try to help support that patient so that there's different people looking at that, that whatever that, that patient's challenges from different perspectives, from, you know, from a trauma-based perspective, from a medical perspective, from a psychiatric perspective, from an addiction perspective. So, you know, and again, because we know for a lot of our folks who are, you know, have, you know, really severely addicted, they, you know, they have more than just an addiction issue. They have so many things going on in life. So, you know, and if they can be overwhelming, um, you know, for, for one prescriber, for one counselor. So sharing as much of that workload, I think, makes, makes such a difference. You know, and I, I think our, our behavioral health, our counseling staff um, really have been instrumental in, in being able to support the prescribers in doing this work. And again, remembering that, you know, we, we get sucked into the trap of addiction treatment is, is all or nothing. 
it's about using or not using. And it's so much more than that. The concept of recovery is, is about how do we look at that person in their life in their entirety. So how do we get away from looking at a urine drug screen every time and saying, did you use heroin? Did you not use heroin? And defining that as our only marker of success when we know that there's so many other markers that lead to recovery and that lead to success. So how do we recognize and try to pay attention and work for them and measure them instead of just this end-all, be-all measure of did you use or did you not use? You know, that there's a lot of other steps that are kind of in that in-between, but let's, let's focus and work on them. Fantastic. Um, we've had a lot of questions roll in, and so uh, I know we've just got uh, uh, 10 more minutes left in our hour, and so let's try to get to as many. Uh, we had one question come in that's related to what a number of you have been talking about. What specific techniques did you use to become more low barrier? This is Dawn. Um, I think one of the tech, one of the techniques that we're using right now is to start Suboxone right away, to not let a patient leave without having a prescription for Suboxone, um, and just trying to keep engaged with that patient. Got it. Other other advice or other approaches that you have found that have worked? Again, I, I would say that, again, throwing out a lot of those rules, you know, and this, this is tough because it really pushes us at times, but, um, you know, concurrent substance use um, or concurrent use of other medications, whether they're illicit or illicit, um, really taking a hard look at what's going on and can we still work with that patient? and sometimes even trying to work with that patient. And the best examples are benzodiazepines, um, cocaine, marijuana, um, you know, because again, yes, you know, do I want those people using those things? No, right? Is it a reality that they are and they very well may be addicted to them or dependent on them? Yes, they are, right? And so in, does, does us refusing treatment or service to those folks, is that going to help them in the big picture? Probably not. And if they're anywhere else that's probably as well equipped to serve them as we are, probably not, right? So I, I think we're the ones that, you know, there aren't a lot of other places that can do this. So we're the ones that are they're gonna end up doing it. So let's give it a stab, let's try it. Got it. Next question. Uh, do you have any mobile clinicians that go into the community and provide medication directly on the street to people in their known spots, or are all participants expected to come to the office or clinic? This is Dawn again. Um, we do not have mobile clinicians yet. I mean, we've talked about it. We're just not sure how we would um, implement that. So our, our program does require that patients come into the health center for treatment. This is Linda. Um, we have a mobile health unit, um, and we plan to um, staff that with clinicians who can provide this treatment in the field. Um, we also have a, a satellite site that we began um, providing a treatment at, um, at a, a soup kitchen, at an emergency feeding uh, location, and that's been, um, that's been great. Uh, next question. We have a provider that wants to taper everyone off of Suboxone as soon as possible. Will you talk to the appropriateness of how long these patients should continue, Matt, and how it is relative to the level of their history of addiction. This is this Dr. Is Reddish. Like a, um, I, think it's a, I, I think it's a great question. Um, it comes up all the time in our practice as well. And there's no cut and dry answer to that. I think that there are many, many patients, and maybe even the majority of patients, that can be on Suboxone for the rest of their lives. And they function, and they carry on, and they have jobs, and they have lives and children and spouses. And that's what keeps them alive, and that's what keeps them from using. Here at Project HOPE, we've been working on eliminating using the term medication-assisted treatment and trying to use medication-assisted recovery um, when we speak about this. And I think if you put it in the perspective of recovery, 
as long as the patient remains in recovery, it's appropriate to continue medication. Hear that? <laughs> um, <laughs> next question. Uh, is it possible to seek MAT assistance with medications for clients with mental illness from local agencies who are already set up? Uh, we have several clients who have substance abuse issues and are not taking the medication for various issues. And this can really benefit from a program who can assist with that medication. So it sounds like they're asking for like more of that integrated care with mental illness uh, medications. Hi, uh, this is Marty. We actually have um, medical providers who are embedded in two uh, local community mental health agency sites. So um, they're able to uh, prescribe buprenorphine in, in those settings. I'm not sure to what extent they are, but we, we have that ability. And so this was a pilot um, project that we, we, we and our main behavioral health care developed together. It's, it was funded by SAMHSA for three years, and we have managed to sustain after the, the funding period. time for maybe a couple more uh, questions. So I'm uh, trying to squeeze them in. For low barrier sites, do you have groups at all? Uh, or what type of support services are you able to provide or do you require? This is Don. Here um, at Project Hope, we offer um, both group and individual counseling. Um, so generally what happens is that someone comes in for their group visit. Um, and at the end of the visit, they'll, they'll get their the Suboxone prescription. Um, and, you know, some people aren't appropriate or some people don't prefer groups, um, and so they can come in for individual visits instead if they want. Um, you know, and that, honestly, it works better for us and works better for them. If, if, they're, if they're really not capable of interacting at that group level and just don't have that functionality, um, you know, then, they, then we see them individually. So, you know, there's, there's no hard and fast rules if you have to be in a group or you have to be seen in an individual session. Some people much prefer the groups, um, so, you know, we can go either way. Um, practice question here. Um, suggestions on strategies to monitor and address a patient not taking all of their buprenorphine? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I want to respond to that with how, how do you know they're not taking all of it? Uh, it's very interesting because I think that this really ties into diversion, right? So if somebody is not using um, all their medication, what are they doing with the rest of it? Am I interpreting that correctly? That's how I interpreted the question, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, which one? <laughs> Please. I think looking at quantitative levels from the urine drug screens and, again, learning how to interpret um, the results from the urine, urine drug screens for the quantitative levels of both the substance and the metabolite is, the, is a big step. So being able to know how to do that, um, you know, gives you some framework. It's not, a, it's not an exact science, but that helps, helps us a little bit. Not it. We are right up at the end. We still have more questions. I think this also just indicates how much information people are looking to, to learn from one another. And so this emboldens us that we will be having uh, more conversations around medication-assisted treatment. Um, and so if I can make a pitch, right at the end of this, a, uh, a survey will come up uh, on, on, on today's webinar. Please uh, tell us what you want to talk further about, and we can design more conversations uh, to get deeper into any of these issues. Uh, and just kind of to, uh, and I'm conscious of having to, to, to close off discussion because I think we're really, you know, kind of just skimming the surface of a lot of issues that we're trying to get deeper into. Um, for right now, though, I just want to call attention to some of the resources we have at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. I uh, want to give a save the date for a training that we're doing in Portland, Oregon this fall, uh, specifically looking at how do we increase the capacity for HCHs and other types of health centers or health providers to do this work. And I just want to highlight the list of policy briefs and webinars and clinical guidelines and all of those things that we've developed here at the Council to be able to support this work. 
Uh, and so with that, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. I absolutely want to say thank you to Dr. Baselli and Brian from, from Project HOPE and Marty and Dr. Meadows and Don uh, from NASA on Healthcare for sharing their expertise with us today. You guys are doing amazing work, and we so appreciate the leadership that you're showing for our field. Uh, so and then thanks again for everybody coming. Uh, shout out to um, at doing the, uh, the survey so that we can know what kind of training opportunities you want and more issues to, to talk about further. Uh, so with that, it's at the top of the hour, and I will uh, bid you all a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>